Ken Coates is beside me on the screen and he's written extensively about Indigenous issues and I'm just kind of catching up on my reading here. I have a 32 page uh, paper that he did uh, in 2008 about the Indian Act and uh, the future of Aboriginal governance in Canada. Boy, big topics. Uh, Ken Coates, welcome. Good, good to be with you, sir. Well, let's start with the Indian Act. Uh, I don't think it's changed much uh, in, uh, since 2008. It has changed a few times in history. But let's start with why we even have one. We don't have, uh, I don't think we have an Old Persons Act or an Infants Act. We have singled out this a particular demographic group to have a piece of federal legislation. Uh, why? Well, there's two parts to it. One is it was put in place in 1876 as a way of controlling Indigenous people who the government of Canada thought they had a paternalistic obligation to, and they were worried about them, to be honest. Back in, in the 1870s, uh, Indian wars were very common south of, the, south of the border in the United States. Canada was concerned that Aboriginal folks, as they were moved off their land because of settlement and other activities, would actually become as, as violent as they were down in the south, and the conflicts would rise up. Um, if you remember that in the, in the, well, the, around the time of Confederation, the budget for the U.S. Cavalry was actually about the same as the budget for all of Canada. So Canada just didn't feel it could afford those kind of conflicts. So it got a sort of a paternalistic response. Um, it then became this governing system of its own that was very authoritarian, paternalistic. The federal government made all the decisions. Um, Aboriginal people did not have very much choice. There were a whole bunch of subtexts to the Indian Act that were quite disruptive. You're now in this odd situation where some communities hate it, but don't, can't imagine what the alternative is. But, but the other part is we actually have a large number of Indigenous communities that are no longer un, under the Indian Act. So when you sign a modern treaty, as the Nishka did, for example, they, the Indian Act disappears. If you sign a modern treaty, as 11 of 14 First Nations in the Yukon have done, um, the Indian Act disappears, same in the Northwest Territories. So we actually have the, and this is an interesting sort of what they call natural experiment because you can look at communities that have gone out from under the Indian Act and communities that are still in the Indian Act and sort of say, okay, is the Indian Act the causal factor here? Is it the, is it the thing that's causing the greatest uh, crisis and, and difficulty? So it's a strange document and it's hard to figure out how to get rid of it. Well, you're a little ahead of both my thinking comprehension and my story here. So let's go back to the people who wrote the Indian Act. Um, I have read that it gives the federal government more control uh, over so-called Indians, uh, Indigenous people, than over any other group in society, save possibly federal prisoners in penitentiaries. Is it that draconian? And pretty close. I, mean, I describe it as a total institution in the sense that it governs all sorts of their affairs. Essentially, the better way to understand it, and I don't say this with, with anything other than dismay, um, is that it, it, it treats Aboriginal people as children. Um, so the, the, the government of Canada is the parent and the Aboriginal people are the children. So if you're a farmer and you have a whole bunch of wheat to sell, back in, until, you know, into the 20th century, you had to get permission to sell the wheat, permission to sell the cows. You had to get, in some instances, permission to leave your reserve. So it really is very much like that childlike arrangement the government of Canada establishes itself as the parent. So there are no other examples, really, except, like you say, you know, the, the, the prisoners who face all sorts of restrictions. Um, it wasn't quite that draconian, but it was this kind of suffocating institution that sort of said, you can't manage your own budget, you can't make your own decisions, you can't control your own land, you can't sell your land, you can't really buy new land. All these rules and regulations that were sort of stripping away bit by bit but boy, has it ever had a long-term impact. It shaped the way Indigenous people thought they could be governed. It, it limited their range of opportunities. Um, it's not a very impressive piece of legislation. Now, without trying to make any excuse for people who are long dead and wrote the act, but trying to put it into context, what do you make of this? In, in about 1830, the British Parliament uh, didn't know where its money was going to poor, the poor commissions or whether it was being used well. And this began quite an interesting debate about ministerial responsibility versus cabinet power, uh, the Peelites and the Whigs uh, in essence. So I'm, I'm guessing that the Indian Act was written by people who at least knew of that 
dilemma and debate about ministerial responsibility, but boy, it, it did it ever go overboard in giving this particular minister, the, Indi the Minister of Indian Affairs, uh, control over that particular population. What, what do you make of that sort of arc and narrative? Well, I think it's actually a very fair comment. I mean, when the, when the document came into existence, the government of Canada, the general perception around the world was that Indigenous people were going to disappear. The demographics were terrible. You had diseases spreading all across Canada. You had large depopulation occurring, um, thousands of people dying through smallpox and whooping cough and measles and influenza and stuff like that. There was a value system at the time that said, the only way we can save in quotation marks indigenous people is to protect them. So you put them on and separate them, put them on reserves, um, keep non-Aboriginal people away as much as you possibly can. And then again, in quotation marks, civilize them through Christianity and through, ed through education. So the government had this sort of agenda that at its heart, people actually sat there in Ottawa and said, we are doing the best thing we possibly can. Now, some of them were racist and they thought that they, the faster the Aboriginal culture disappeared, the better, but not all of them. And, and some of the people were thinking, well, we just, as humanitarians, we are concerned about their fate. So they should be integrated, assimilated as fast as possible. They'll have better life choices, better incomes, better opportunities. That's a good thing. So, so those pieces I think are, are really important to keep in mind. Um, but so in retrospect, of course, they made thousands of wrong decisions around the indigenous field. They made well, here's, here's one, and, and people, I think it's fair to say, people in power, very often do arbitrary things. And my mother used to tell me she was left-handed and would be smacked with a ruler on her left hand if she was writing with her left hand. You know, just gratuitous uh, uh, use of authority. Why would the Indian Act uh, ban cultural practices such as uh, certain dancing and potlatches? It's hard to imagine uh, today, maybe there was some way to imagine it back in the day, but it's hard to imagine how uh, the, the sun dance and other dances and the potlatch would be a threat to uh, bureaucrats writing a piece of legislation in Ottawa. Can you explain that to me? Boy, you asked me to explain really complicated things in a short way, but I'll do it as best I can. But essentially, the protest against the cultural practices came largely from the Christian churches. And they were mortified at these, in quotation marks again, savage behaviors, these heathen activities. They were trying to get them to be good Christians and live in a good Christian way. So one of the things you do is stop this. The potlatch was seen at the time as being incredibly uh, anti-capitalist. But what would happen is somebody would collect a whole bunch of things, uh, have a party and give them all away. Now for indigenous people, ironically, the potlatch was like a banking system. If I gave you four blankets, you were obliged to give me back five at some later date or some other number. You had to, if I gave you a gift, you had to give me a bigger gift, right? So in fact, if I had a whole bunch of blankets, if I gave them away, I was pr protecting my future, which is a very smart thing to do. But the church looked at this and said, this is outrageous. They're engaging in non-economic activity. They're, they're, they're having wild parties and wild dances and there's all sorts of mysticism and spirituality going on. It's so anti-Christian. And at the time that carried sway. They convinced the government of the time to, to change the laws, to bring the hammer down on indigenous people in some very dramatic ways. They put elders in jail, you know, in, in, the, in the BC penitentiary, in New Westminster, put them in jail for actually having Christmas, the indigenous equivalent of a big party and a big celebration. So for indigenous people, it basically discredited the legal enterprise. Think about it from that point of view. If well, you, I will say, I will concede that you have explained, you, you have not justified and we're not seeking to justify, <laughs> but I would kind of add without really my tongue in my cheek that if you want mysticism, uh, you only need to look at transubstantiation, uh, praying through icons, uh, crossing oneself and other um, perfectly acceptable traditions in, in, the, uh, in, in Western churches. Um, but uh, perhaps I digress. Now, you, in your narrative, you were talking uh, about uh, certain uh, bands or nations uh, being exempt from the Indian Act, and that's a bit of a mixed blessing. Let's start with the question, why do some Indigenous people want to keep the Indian Act as draconian as it may be? Well, that, that's a question you have to ask of the individual communities because they're not all of them are debating this. 
if you're a community that's already suffering uh, economically and culturally and facing all sorts of administrative problems, it's not the time to talk about a major political revolution. There are communities that are actually doing quite well under the impact and economically. They, they've, their band and council is working effectively. They set up an economic, economic development corporation. That's working effectively. They control their own schools as they're allowed to do. That's working okay. So then okay and say, well, why don't we go through all the changes in the Indian Act uh, and, and, and get rid of it? Others have a vested interest in the political structure. So the political structure, it's a, the band elections follow the democratic principles. When you move outside the Indian Act, a lot of communities are reestablished traditional governance. So you go back to clan governance, for example, where each clan picks a representative and those, those clans representatives then become the government. Well, that doesn't follow with sort of Canadian democratic, democratic principles. And so the people just find that a bit, a bit odd. And, and so they don't favor that kind of transition. The third one is there's a concern around that when the government favors something, there's some other underhanded motive behind it. And you can understand where that comes from because that was always the case, right? So if the government says, we want you to consider moving outside the Indian Act, a lot of First Nations say, you're trying to get rid of your responsibility for us. You have treaty obligations, you have you know, Indian Act obligations, you have all these kind of policy obligations. You want us out of the Indian Act so you can leave us alone and we'll be worse off. All right, let, so let, let, me, let me capitalize uh, on that phrase, uh, get rid of. Um, because there is certainly a scenario whereby if you turn a reserve into um, fee simple ownership and you turn a band into a corporation, you eventually uh, cause uh, what are legally called Indians to disappear and Indian lands to disappear. And that is going to be a significant um, event or, at le or even tragedy uh, in the future. How, what's your view on that? So we, we know we don't have to guess because we've actually can look and see what happens. So the state of Alaska, for example, when they did the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act in 1969, they actually brought in new, what they call uh, native corporations. And they actually gave land to the communities. Initially, they for, it was protected for 20 or 30 years. I can't remember how long it was. Um, and if they went bankrupt, then, then at the end of that time, they could come and take the land. Well, some of them did go bankrupt or almost bankrupt. So they change the legislation so they wouldn't lose the land. So if you go to Alaska, they're, they're native corporations. They're outside you know, the Indian affairs in its traditional way. They're very self-governing. Some of them have done amazing things economically and educationally and culturally. Uh, they've done some of the best responses to the pandemic in the world. They've actually come out of Alaska First Nations. Um, so, so it doesn't mean a sort of a either or sort of proposition. The other ones, when you look in the in case of the Yukon, and Northwest Territories and Nunavut and places like that, what the, what the First Nations said was, we're going to get rid of the Indian Act and we're going to replace it with a modern treaty. And the modern treaty will give us control through what are called Settlement A and Settlement B lands of 9% of our traditional territory. So now we actually have big chunks of land that belong to us and we have full control over those lands and it gives the rights of self-government so they can actually take down different governmental authorities not automatically, not instantly, but when they want to. Um, and so we have models where communities can look and say, gee, you know, they went down that path and here's the problems and here's the achievements in those particular areas. So we have models of where things work and models of where things didn't work. So we don't have to guess as to what actually happens down the line. So you don't, you know, what happens in the case of the Yukon is Aboriginal people, actually they never had reserves in the Yukon really, um, so they actually get control of lands they didn't even have before. So they're actually better off. The Nishka had reserves before, now they have settlement lands. And the Nishka are doing rather well, thank you very much. But what about the specific danger of fee simple ownership causing either uh, the sale of it or the development of it, or in some way eventually disenfranchising uh, those indigenous people from that land or dislodging them from that land? So right now, that really isn't a model that we use in Canada very much, where you take, take your reserve and turn it into fee simple land. That was the, what they call the Dawes Act in the United States in the 1880s, where they thought they'd just break up the reservations and break up all the land and all that sort of stuff. What we actually do in Canada now, you have the right under, under the First Nations Land Management Act to actually take small pieces of land and turn them into essentially fee, surpa, fee simple ownership for an individual. So if you were living on Nishka land, you could go to the government and say, I'm a Nishka person, I want to own my land, and you could get it taken out 
but you know, it's still part of the community. Um, and and if you if you ever had to sell it, it had to stay part of the community. So it's not completely fee simple in the way we understand it. But they convert it so much that you can actually borrow against it. So the three people who did this in Nishka territory borrowed against their land to start businesses. But of course, it, it hasn't taken off. We haven't seen thousands of people doing this across the country. When First Nations people want to own land, they buy land outside the reserve. Um, nope. And they wish they can do. Uh, Ken Coates, whenever I'm uh, speaking with an academic, I like to work in some academic humor, which is not usually funny, but it, it is academic humor. Uh, and this is especially true with you because uh, you are associated with my uh, second university, the University of Regina, and the great Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. And both uh, the names Johnson and Shoyama are inextricably linked to uh, Medicare. And I knew Al Johnson when I was at the CBC and he'd been president of the Treasury Board and uh, on, uh, the, on the history goes. So here's the, uh, the quip. Uh, the people writing the Indian Act, if they were, if they were worried about the anti-capitalist nature of the potlatch ceremony, which in a way you've simply described as trade, and whether it was a good or a bad deal is up to those trading, according to uh, Adam Smith, I think. Uh, why weren't they worried about the uh, 1848 Communist Manifesto or the Fourth International or the Paris Commune? I mean, they had a lot more to worry about than the potlatch, didn't they? They did. They did. And it's, in, in retrospect, you look back and you think, you know, why did they put so much effort into constraining so few people and doing it in such a harmful and, and discriminatory way? Um, and the consequences, of course, live with us for a long time. And, and the, again, governments have lots of things to worry about. Um, in fact, even, even when these regula regulations were going through, the First Nations on the Prairie West were not coming up in big arms and big battles. I mean, we had the 1885 rebellion, but in global terms, that's a very, very small uprising. You know, we, we did not see that kind of protest and whatever. It, it wasn't necessary at the time. There were much other, many other models. But it was based in this sort of 19th century racial superiority idea that Indigenous people were on the verge of dying out um, now, and had to be saved. Ken Coates, the reading that I've done uh, of yours uh, dates to uh, 2008. Uh, so I at least want to give you the opportunity to respond to, is there something new? Have you had new thoughts about this? Or where are we going? And uh, pick uh, one or all of those uh, to respond to if you wish. So what I would say is that in 2008, the concept of indigenous self-government was relatively new. There were not very many places practicing it. They were tending to take down control of a healthcare or education, but not more comprehensive. We've now actually had a lot of experience. Um, Nunavut is a self-ruling administrative district. Um, the Treaty Nations in Yukon, Northern British and Northwest Territories are self-administered. Self um, what, what's new? is indigenous people are taking back control of their lives and being quite successful at it. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised by that. They're smart, intelligent, capable people. They're living with the weight of history in ways that non-indigenous Canadians rarely do. Um, but they've actually done really well. And you can find situations across the country where some of our most innovative communities uh, are doing really well. If you look in Saskatchewan, for example, Whitecap First Nation is about 25 kilometers south of Saskatoon. And it often has the lowest unemployment rate in the province. Um, they've got lots of good things. They've got a casino, a resort, a golf course. They've got lots of businesses going on. Um, it's extremely well run by its chief and its council. Um, and we can look at these places and say, you know, my gosh, were we ever wrong? And, and imagine what would have happened if we hadn't interfered. I'll use one last example from the prairies. When the prairie first, when the treaty process was started, the government of Canada said to First Nations, you have to go live on reserves. And the First Nations said, oh, okay, well, let's put us all together so we can sort of be with our friends and neighbors and, 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 and our cousins and our, and our relatives. And government said, no, you can't do that. We want you to break apart and go in, in smaller little, little, little groups. So if you look at, at the prairie map on the uh, uh, on, of treaty of a modern on the, sorry, reserves, it looks like chicken box, little box here and there all over the place, right? If the First Nations had had their way, they probably would have all been concentrated in one place. And you would have had a single community by now, probably of 40 or 50,000 indigenous people, autonomous, self-governing, with their language strong and their culture strong. What a great addition that would be to Canada. 
instead of breaking them up into small pieces for our administrative convenience and because of fear of a future uprising. So we've missed a thousand opportunities to cooperate, collaborate and be partners. We're now trying to rebuild those things. And the good news is that the rebuilding exercise works. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know about the Supreme Court ruling on the so-called subsidiarity, uh, the word meaning that, and I think I, I am not convinced the Supreme Court is correct on this, but the government that is most uh, uh, able and appropriate to uh, enact uh, a service is the government closest to the people, and that is the, the municipal government. This sounds American to me, you know, local governments, uh, is uh, supreme, but isn't that an argument also to devolve responsibility to uh, the indigenous structure locally as opposed to through the feds or through the provinces? I, I think there's lots of reasons to devolve it to the local communities. If no other one than the other models don't work. So we tried provincial and federal run schools, they don't work. We have healthcare systems, they've had very poor success. So we've tried those models and they don't work, right? So, so surely we can try something else. If you want my, my, my comment, I guess though, I think the individual reserve by itself is a creation of government. First Nations did not historically live on one little tiny piece of land set aside from all other people. They lived in a broad area and they were in close relations with their, their relatives who moved back and forth across the land with them. So my, my favorite example, because it's been very successful has been Northern Quebec with the James Bay Cree and also the Inuit of Northern Quebec, where they've created really strong regional governments. They, the one thing missing with bringing it down to the level of the First Nation is you lose the economy of scale. You're down to a community of a thousand people. If you're lucky, some of them are 200 people. Maybe there are 2000 people. If you've got a large First Nation community, there's only so much you can do. There are only so many people you have in leadership positions, so many resources and whatever. So my view basically is that in the years to come, we're going to see whether they're tribal tribal councils, whether they're federations like the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations or, or the Treaty 8 First Nations in northern, uh, northern Alberta and northern British Columbia, that we're going to get these groups becoming more program delivery agencies. Because you get an economy of scale, um, you get efficiencies in operations, you learn from each other collaboratively. So you don't have to go from the federal government down to the tiniest element, which is a community of 500 people, you can actually have intermediary steps and perhaps they're different for different programs. You know, so in some instances, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations runs the first or owns, collaborates, set up the First Nations University of Canada and it's been really successful. You know, so that's a, that's a provincial wide organization dealing with something they deliver to their whole, their, their whole community. So there's, there's, there's steps in between. And, and, I, and you didn't suggest we had to go one or the other, but I think we should look very carefully at those steps in between. And you basically take that subsidiary principle and essentially say, but let's look at this uh, sort of service by service and project by project, you know, because a lot of communities are too small to do all the things they might have to do. And you can do it some other way. So we can be more creative. Indigenous communities are being more creative. There's hope. Well, I'll also quip that um, my skepticism about uh, subsidiarity is uh, a result of my having worked in municipal government, but that's uh, perhaps for a different interview. Um, let me just say that anyone watching who Googles Ken Coates uh, or Googles your name at the, um, is it the McDonald Laurier Institute? Uh, right. Will find a good dozen uh, articles about uh, relevant topics and I encourage people to do that. And I would say, um, if this were your uh, defense and you didn't need to defend it, but let's say this were your thesis defense, um, I would probably say, is there anything you'd like to add, Ken Coates, before we wrap up and give you your much deserved degree? All, all I would say is, if we learn one lesson from history is that partnership with indigenous communities is the future um, and that we cannot make decisions for them. And we can't even really make, certainly make decisions with them but, but we can empower indigenous communities to make their decisions uh, for themselves. And when they do that, they, they become stronger and that's in everybody's interest. Here, here. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome.